Um, some funny things I thought through women versus men stuff. Here's some funny stuff. Uh, handwriting. To the credit of men, we don't decorate our penmanship. We just write it. Now, you may not be able to read it, but we write it. I'm a much better typer than I am a writer. Uh, women use scented, colored stationery, and they dot the I with circles or hearts. Women use ridiculously large loops in the B and G. It is a pain to read a note from a woman. Oh, <laughs> sad. Uh, let's talk groceries. A woman makes a list of the things she needs. I know this to be true. Allie is meticulous about the th way she makes her list. It's meal plan first, and then she starts working through what is going to go on this meal plan, duh, duh, duh. and then how do we buy what's on this meal plan, and then we buy it, and then we buy exactly what we need. I'll go to the store, like Allie's going out of town today, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the store, get some food for Drew and I, which is going to essentially be like frozen pizzas and chicken nuggets, right? And I'm just going to walk through and be like, I could use that, and that, and that, and I would like that. So that's what we're doing. And then we leave out milk. Um, women, they mature much faster than men. Most 17-year-old females can function as adults. True? Yes? Have we seen this? Yeah? Most 17-year-old men still giving wedgies in the gym locker room in high school, right? Men, how many part of that? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's the more tame stuff that goes on there. Uh, bathrooms, men, married men, married women, you can attest to this. A man has approximately six items, a toothbrush, shaving cream and razor, if they are beardless. If they aren't, then they don't need to have anything. Uh, a bar of soap and a towel. Women, the average number of items in the typical women's bathroom is 437. <laughs> and a man can typically not identify what any of those items are. True men? Amen? Yes. Today we're talking about biblical womanhood. We, we've decided to choose the, the day where we'd probably have the fewest number of people here to talk about this. Uh, this is, this is a, a topic that, that's hard to discuss, and it's usually because it's bu built up and pent up within our culture's understanding of what womanhood is. It, it kind of seeps in to the church, and we have an understanding. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to explain City View's stance on, on biblical womanhood. What, what City View is, that the, the position we take is we take what's called a complementarian position. Now, in the, in the world, there's, there's the egalitarian, and we'll get to that in a second, and then there's the domineering male, and, and we are not either one of those. Instead, we, we, we go complementarian. An egalitarian is men and women are, completed, are created completely equal, and they do the exact same things with the exact same functions all the time, whether in the home, in the work, or whatever. That's not where City View lands. We're also not on this side that says that, that, that men are, you know, we're, we pound our fists and we're great, and this is what we do. Instead, what we do, what we, the place we take is we say, God created us equally in his image, okay? Genesis 1. God created men and women equally in his image, but he made them differently. So he made men different than women, right? We can all point out those, those, those typical issues, uh, but, but he's also given different function to men and women within society, within re, with, specifically within the church and within marriage. And so at City View Church, we're, we're going to be a church that is elder-governed. Elder-governed, the way we read 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, which is those passages that talk about church leadership, is those passages, the, those, that highest level of church government, that highest level of church leadership is for men. And so men will serve as elders. That, that's the way this will set up. But below that, you go one step below that, what, what we're going to get down to is women can be staff, women can be part of the leadership of structure, voices in the church, but the way, el the way our church is going to function is that there's elders, and those elders, they, they function in three separate roles. They, they work in doctrine, they work in discipline, and they work in direction. And so that's the role of the elder. That, that, that's kind of the, the big idea. And, but women in our church are going to be able to serve in every area outside of that eldership role. That, that is, everything is open, everything is available, but we're going to be biblical in the way that we approach this. Does that make sense? And, and we, we believe that men and women are created equally in the image of God, but have different roles. And we think it's laid out like this throughout Scripture. So if you, you look all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, you're going to see men lead homes, women lovingly submit, and, and this is the way things work better. 
This is the way things work best. This is what's laid out in Ephesians 5. And so when we talk biblical womanhood, we aren't talking as, uh, as, as people who are going to pound our fists and say, do what we say, submit, submit, submit. That's not a loving man. That's not a man who is uh, leading his home well. That is not appropriate or biblical in any way. And if, ladies, if your husband's acting like that, let me know and we'll go take him out back to the shed, okay? Um, this is, th- th- that's an inappropriate way to lead. Men, you are to lead. And we talk about this week after week for men and women. We do this. We, we want to make sure that you understand. Women, you have a hard job to submit. Submission is a hard word to chew on, a hard word to think through, hard word to swallow. Ooh, do we want to do that or not? Men, you have a much harder job, much harder job, according to Ephesians 5. It's to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. So women, you are supposed to lovingly submit to your husband. Men, you are supposed to lead like Christ loved the church. What did Christ do for the church? He came, he died, and he rose again. That is a much, much, much more difficult role, in my opinion. So women, submit to men who do that. We're going to go to Ruth chapter 3. If you have your Bible, we're going to go to Ruth chapter 3. We're going to continue our discussion on, on, uh, from the book of Ruth. We're going to, we're, we're going to look through uh, this, this last... Mm, next, next week's going to be our last week. This is going to be uh, our last kind of men versus woman conversation. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 1. Here it is. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you? that it may be well with you. Now, let me catch up here. Remember, Ruth chapter 1, uh, Elimelech dies. That's Naomi's husband. Then Malon and Chilion die. That's Naomi's uh, son and sons. And Ruth and Orpah, these two ladies, uh, they are now without their... They were married to Malon and Chilion. Remember, that means weak and sickly, awesome names for kids. And, and, and they... They are now connected to Naomi. Naomi says, hey, Orpa, hey, Oprah, Orpah and Ruth, go back to your people. Go back to your family. Go back there. We don't, you, you shouldn't have to stick with me. Go back. And Orpah says, okay. And Ruth says, no way. And, they're, and they head off to Israel. So they go to Israel together, uh, her and Ruth. And Ruth, and, or, and at the end of that, Naomi, at the end of chapter one, Naomi says, hey, don't call me Naomi anymore, which means pleasant. And said, she says, call me Mara, which means bitter, because now I'm bitter and I'm a lot of fun at parties. And then we, then, then we jump into chapter two. And in chapter two, uh, you, you see Ruth, who has this like powerful persona of I am going to be worthy. I'm going to work hard. I am going to do all the things that I should do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push and work, and we're introduced to a guy named Boaz. And Boaz, his name means worthy or excellence. And, and th- this guy is a worthy or excellent man. He's a man who, 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 who stands and looks strong and is powerful, loves the Lord, and it's seen all throughout his people, all throughout the people who work for him. And in the end, we looked at that story last week, and we said, Ruth works hard, and she does everything she can but she can't redeem herself. She can't save herself. She's in need of someone to show grace to her. And Boaz graciously does. We looked at that and we saw, that we, we, we saw how, how Jesus does this for us. That Jesus is this redeemer. Jesus is this one who loves us, who cares for us, who is there. So chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, we, we saw this. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that you may be well with you? So she's just saying, Hey, I think we need to figure something else out. This is, gonna, this is not going to perpetuate well. Verse 2, Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Real quick winnowing deal. So what they're doing is they're, they're in the middle of barley harvest. So Boaz has all these fields. He's a rich guy, so he's got all these fields. And what they do is they, they would take the barley, they'd go down this winnowing floor, and it was kind of shaped like this, and, they, and they, would, they would sit there, and they would do this, and they'd throw it up in the air. And the chaff, which is the stuff that's around the actual good parts of the barley, would be blown off by the wind, and the barley would, would fall down to the ground. So that's what, he, that's what they're doing for much of that, this evening. Uh, verse 3, wash therefore, <laughs> please take a bath, 
and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Chapter 3 is an awesome chapter, but it's filled with all kind of weird cultural stuff, all right? And in order to understand chapter 3, in order to understand who, who, what Ruth is and who Ruth is, and uh, you, you're really going to have to pay attention to the cultural stuff. So what, what Ruth is doing, what Naomi's telling Ruth to do, is essentially get ready because you're going to go propose to him. Wait, that doesn't seem right. That's what she's going to do. Um, look, look back. In verse 2, it says this, uh, is not Boaz our relative? Now, that word relative, you know, we think of relative, and we think of, like, aunts, uncles, people we see at Christmas, Thanksgiving, those kind of things. The word relative here, it's the word, uh, it, 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 it's the word goel, and it's kinsman. And what kinsman means in, in this context is, is, is this kinsman is a person who can do something to help get Naomi and Ruth out of the situation that they are currently stuck in. So Naomi has nothing. Ruth is less than nothing and is underneath her authority. And so they're trying to figure out how do we find a way out of this particular issue. And she said, Naomi says to Ruth, hey, little, little, little scheming among women here. He, hey, he's our kinsman. He can do something about the position that we find ourselves in. And so let's get to it. So what you do is you you bathe. So ladies, just a quick tip. You want to catch a man, single ladies out there, take a bath. Well, just an idea. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Uh, anoint yourself with oil. So this is like a perfume substance that she's putting on. Like, like she, she's got a, she, 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 she wants to smell good when she sees him. Uh, put your cloak on, get ready. You're going to go down there. And when you see him, watch him because he's going to be working all night. He's going to work all night. He's going to eat. They're going to have dinner. Then he's going to go to sleep right there because what they've done is they've harvested all this stuff. This is a community threshing floor. Where everybody uses the same thing. So here's this community threshing floor. Everybody's using the same thing. And what people will do is they will have their men guard their, their take, which is their barley harvest. And, and they'll sleep there all night long to make sure no one steals it. So he's going to be there. This is a perfect opportunity for you to do this. And go down and uncover his feet. That sounds gross, right? Why would you uncover his feet? Well, you want, that's something you need to know before you get married is what do his feet smell like? Does he have a foot fungus or not? That's an important aspect, ladies. No, what, 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 what's going on is, is this is an act of dependence. What she's going to do is she's going to uncover his feet and this at some point during the night is going to awaken him. She is going to lay at, the, lay at his feet, showing her dependence upon him. And when he awakens and sees her laying at his feet, she's going to say, he, he, he's going to tell her what to do at that point. So all that is laid out, and this is what Naomi tells Ruth, and then Ruth says, verse 5, we put that back up on the screen, verse 5? says this, and she replied, all that you say, I will do. Number one, hard pill to swallow, ladies. Biblical women submit to their authority. So when Malon and Chilion died, we don't, we don't really know which one was uh, Ruth's husband, suspected that's Malon. When, when, when he dies, Ruth is now underneath Naomi's authority. Naomi, Orpah too, when Chilion dies. Orpah releases Naomi releases Orpah. Naomi says, no way, I'm clinging to you. We're not going anywhere. You're not getting rid of me. I'm not, I'm not leaving. And they are bound together. And so now their relationship is for the good of the other. But Naomi is the head. So Naomi says, do this. What does Ruth say? I will. I will do this. Um... How do you say this well? Ladies, submission is hard. No one's going no to say anything else. 
I'm not going to say anything else. Maybe someone else will say something else. Submission is hard. But this is what biblical womanhood looks like. Submission is not an easy thing. But this is what biblical womanhood looks like. Is that when there's an authority above me who's going to call me to do something correctly, biblical, godly, gospel-centered, and they say, do, I do. You think Ruth may have had some, like, anxious moments in the middle of this? Like, you want me to go do what? I'm going to go down to a threshing floor and put on this cloak thing, and I'm going to do, I'm going to uncover his feet? That's weird. Then I'm going to sit there smelling them all night till he wakes up? Wait a second. Yeah, of course she did. But she trusted her leader. And in this moment, Naomi's her leader. No, soon it'll be Boaz when she marries him. Ladies, what the Bible calls you to when you're married is to submit to your husband, to respect him, to listen to him. Is he always going to make the right decision? Every lady in the room says, no way. And they're right. But when there's this biblical submission going on, there's a loving head and biblical submission underneath it. The, the husband, if he's wise is going to listen to his wife. Here's the thing. You've both been put there for a reason. Men are there to lead. Women are there to submit. But that's at the end when the decision has to be made. While the decision-making process is going on, put your input in. Throw it in. Let him know. Let him know the issues. Tell him what's going on. Share it. Share it. Speak about it. Give it. And, hey, men, listen to it. Don't just say, I know better. Because frequently, you don't. Just because you are given this biblical role doesn't mean you know more. It just means this is the position that you happen to be in. And women are going to submit easier when they know that their voice is heard. Allie says this all the time. Ali, Ali, we you know we talk about men and women getting married. We talk about engagement. We do some engagement, you know, some premarital counseling with people together. Sometimes some marital counseling together. And and one of the things we talk about with them is is how important, especially the premarital groups, is is how important it is to marry the right man. Women, how important it is for for you to marry the right man, because. It's going to be really hard to do Ephesians 5 when he's a jerk, right? How important it is to marry this man who is already you see submission to the Lord. Already you see he loves God. Already you see, all right, he listens and he knows, he reads the scripture, he's there. It's easy to submit to that man. It's very difficult to submit to the other guy. So ladies, single ladies, I feel like Beyonce. <clears throat> Everything I own in the box to the left. All right. Uh, <clears throat> pick a man who loves Jesus, who loves his word, who loves who loves God, who loves what the Bible says, who's going to raise children, who, who may not one day be involved in the church, but is already involved in the church, pick this man. Ladies, and your husband is not this man. What are you supposed to do? Nag him to death until he does what he's supposed to, right? That's, what, that's it. That's it. That's what it is. 
Whenever, whenever Pastor Jason talks about biblical manhood, I make sure that I elbow him in the, in the ribs the whole time. When, when, whenever, whenever that Ephesians 5 thing comes up, I make sure, I remind him over and over again, you're supposed to die for me. That's why I submit. No. Some of you are like, that's, that's the right answer, right? No. No, I mean, 1 Peter 3 says something different. It says that, hey, hey, women, your husband may not be godly, and if he's not, you don't needle and nag him. Pray for him. You don't needle and nag him. You pray for him. But Jason, what if he never changes? That's not up to you. That's, that's not your call. I think the reason people struggle with this, hey, we, I'm supposed to pray about it thing, is because we just don't, I think I can do better than God. I can tell him to get, I can tell him to get better. And if I, just, if I just tell him and then he just hears me do it, then he's definitely going to change. He's going to be different. He's going to do exactly what I want him to do. No, he's not. Because here's the thing about men. They're stubborn. And they will compartmentalize this. They'll hear you nag, 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 nag. Hey, that's going to go in this box over here called wife nagging. And I'm going to function outside of this box that's wife nagging. This is where I live, outside of this wife nagging box over here. You think you're getting through to him sometimes. He's just like, I'm just quiet because it's in the box. But I live outside this box. And this is me. You're not getting anywhere by the nag. You're not. Prayer makes a way. Speaking lovingly to him makes a way. There, there is a way to speak to your husband about stuff, about things where he may be failing, but it's never in the do this better way. It's in a loving, humble heart way. Women, you, you, you have this well, I mean, who's, who hasn't seen Big Fat Greek Wedding, right? Where, 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 you know, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck that turns the head, right? It's true on a lot of different levels. Women, you, you support the head. Without you, there's no connection to the rest of the body. You matter in an unbelievably important way. Biblical women submit to their authorities. Number two. I spent a lot of time on that point. Don't worry. We won't spend a lot of time on all, all the points. Look at verse six. Here it is. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. So he's done all his work. He's eaten dinner. His stomach's full. He's feeling good. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. So he's asleep, and now the weird thing happens where the feet are uncovered, you know, uh, toenail fungus in full effect. Verse 8, at midnight, the man was startled. Yeah. Uh, number one, my feet are cold, right? Number two, hey, there's a woman down there. Scary. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. <laughs> Exclamation point. Verse 9. He said, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Number two, biblical women are bold and respectful. Biblical women, you are bold and respectful. I mean, hey, ladies, how many of you in this room propose to your husband? How many of you? Anybody? 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 Zero, right? <laughs> oh, one? Okay. My bad. That's not typically the way it goes in our society, right? Men, you're, you, 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 pay, you save up two months for a ring, you, you get down on one knee, you do the planning. And I always say this, when men get engaged, they're ready to be married that day. 
Like, okay, I've made all the things, I've gone through all the thinking, I've spent the money, I'm ready, uh, let, will you marry me? I got a pastor down the way, we can get married right now. Let's, let's go to Vegas today, we can get this done immediately. I know a JP, we'll get this figured out. That's how men are. When they're like, hey, will you marry me? The answer is yes, okay, now. The, the, this isn't the way women think. There's got to be the whole, uh, the whole wedding planning stuff that goes on, right? What she's doing, she's coming here to say, hey, will you marry me? Ruth, Ruth, Ruth comes and that's what she's saying. Is she uncovers his feet and says, spread your wings over me as our redeemer. The idea is, hey, envelop us, take over, redeem me, redeem my mother-in-law, redeem us. She's bold, but she's also respectful. She's not, she, she's not just, marry me because you should. I'm a really good woman. Do what, I, do what I say. Uncovers his feet and waits. Sign of respect and dependence. And then she sits and listens to what he's going to do. She doesn't argue with him after, she, after he gives his explanation. She does what she's supposed to do. Ladies, we covered this in the last point a little bit, but in order for him to function in his greatest role to lead, you have to function in your greatest role to submit. Or really what that word in Ephesians means is, is it really means respect. And there's this thing that happens, ladies. There, there, there's this thing that goes on inside, and, and I've talked about this. There's a book out there by Emerson Egerich. It's called uh, Love and Respect. I love this book because I think it's really biblical. I think it really helps with, with big picture issues inside of marriage. Uh, here's the thing. Here's what men need. Men need respect. We need that. We, we, we need respect. We like to be loved. Love is great. It's good to hear that you love me. It's good to hear that you're with me. It's good to hear you're not, you know, that we're going to be together. I want you to love me, but what I need is to be respected. Women naturally give love, do not naturally give respect. But women, on the other hand, they like respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, baby. I spelled it right. Don't check me. They like respect, but they need love. Men do not naturally give love. Men naturally give respect. This is the natural thing for, for how men work. That's how they go at work. They naturally respect their, their bosses. They naturally respect the people they work with. Naturally respect people within, the mil, within their military branches. They naturally respect. They don't naturally love. So you see the, you see the incongruence here? Men need respect. Women don't naturally give respect. Women need love. Men don't naturally give love. So if there's an issue in your marriage, which, hey, if it hasn't happened today, it will later. Today, on the drive home, on the way out the door. One of the biggest issues, women, show respect to your husband but I don't want to. Do you want to keep fighting? If you don't want to keep fighting, show respect. If you want to keep fighting, then this thing called the crazy cycle happens where she won't show me respect, so I'm not going to show her love. So I'm not going to show him respect because he's not showing me love. And it just keeps on going until one person says, wait a second. I'm going to do biblically what God's called me to do in this moment. And I'm going to show respect, even though I don't really want to. Or biblically in this moment, I'm going to show love even when I don't really want to. Biblical women, biblical women are both bold and respectful. And you see this in Ruth. Number three, here we go. Biblical women also seek a great reputation. Look at verse 10. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. 
you have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after younger men, whether poor or rich. So Ruth is young. Who do young women normally go after? Well, unless they're gold diggers, right? They normal, normally after young men. Verse, verse 11, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. So Ruth has a reputation that is good. Ruth's got this reputation of, 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 heart, of, of loving Naomi, of caring for this, of working very hard. I mean, you can see in chapter 2, if you were to look back there, it, the, the workers that work for Boaz recognize that this woman is a hard worker. She worked from dawn until dusk, and she took this little tiny break in the middle. This woman works hard. They're proud of Ruth in there, and you guys aren't. She has a great reputation. Guys, look for women with great reputations. Look for women who, who, who do this. Women, seek to be this woman. Seek to have this kind of reputation. And here's the thing. When we talk about great reputation, normally where our first you know, thought goes is to the sexual side of this, is, hey, you know, well, I'm not, I'm not that kind of a girl. Okay, good. Don't be that kind of a girl. But great reputation goes so much further beyond the sexual world. Great reputation. Is she a gossip? Does she have to talk about stuff like that all the time? Is she a liar? Here's one. Here's one that I think just women you, str you struggle with. Men struggle with different parts of this, but women you struggle with in a different way. The biblical word is coveting, but, but, it, but it's wanting something, wanting clothes, housing, decor, uh, jewelry, stuff, wanting this, and it's not time for this. Ladies, your reputation needs to be that of submitted to the Lord, respectful to authority. Is it wrong to try to earn to get these things. No, that's not wrong. I don't want to go there. We're not doing that. But, but it, what's your attitude about stuff? Is it I want more? I need more? I've got to have more stuff to be happy? If I only had this thing, then I would be happy. If I only did this thing, then I would be happy. If we only went on this trip, then I would be happy. Let me say this to you. There's no thing that's going to make you happy. There's no thing that's going to fix that hole inside of you, outside of Jesus. All the ladies are scowling at me now, so we're going to move on. <laughs> Look at verse 12. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. This is Boaz saying, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. So just so you know, this is not a sexual thing. She's laying there, still presumably at his feet, poor lady. And, and, she, and she rises early before anybody else sees, and, and he is very careful to protect her reputation in the middle of this and, and sends her home with, with this with the six ephahs of barley. So she, she's got a lot of food now that she's carrying. And what, why does she do that? Well, you know, I've, some people read this and they say, well, he's paying for whatever. No, what, what he's doing is he's showing her, hey, I'm serious about this. And he's going to take this home to Naomi, her head, her person that she's submitting to, and say, hey, this guy's serious about this. So at the, end of this, at the end of this chapter, what Naomi says is he's going to settle this matter today. Boaz is a man of action. He's going to take care of you. He's going to figure this thing out today, and we're either going to be redeemed by this guy who's closer, or we're going to be redeemed by Boaz. Either way we win, it's going to be settled. We're going to be okay. Rest easy. Rest easy. We're going to be okay. We're going to be taken care of. There's another man from Judah, born in Bethlehem, who says, you're going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. 
His name is Jesus. We sing a little song to Judd. Judd. Judd's our youngest, and we sing Jesus Loves Me Every Night. I sing it to him. And when I sing it to him, I sing it really badly because I'm a bad singer. But I want my children to know that I sing to them. Not to you people, but to him. And so we sing Jesus Loves Me, and Judd's really cute about it. He says, you know, Jesus loves me this I know. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me soap. Because he can't say so, he just says soap. I don't, Jesus loves me for the soap. Anyway. The story behind that song is pretty amazing as we talk about this Redeemer. It was written by a woman named Anna Wagner. Anna Wagner was, uh, she lived across the river from the United States Military Academy in Annapolis. And when she lived across, across the river from there, she would go back and forth on Sundays and she would teach the cadets Bible, Bible study. She'd do Sunday school for them back then. And she would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And when, when she would go back and forth and she taught them this, she wanted them, she had this heart for them because she knew that these men were going to go off to war and to die for the country that she loved. They were going to go protect her and where she lived. And so she had a heart for them. She wanted to teach them Bible. And in the middle of teaching them this stuff, in the middle of doing this th- for them, what she wrote the song, Jesus Loves Me. Because she wanted them to know in the middle of the battle, when everything looks bleak, that there's a Redeemer who loves me. Let me read you some of the words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Second verse. I didn't even know this verse. Jesus loves me, loves me still, though I'm very weak and ill, that I might from sin be free, bled and died upon the tree. And she wanted them to really get this last verse. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Jesus loves me, he will stay. And in the the story I read, She's thinking of them in the foxhole. She's thinking of them on the battle line in this last stanza. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. When they are struggling and they are worried and they are concerned and without help and without hope, she wants them to remember Jesus loves them. The Redeemer is there and is going to take care of them. The Redeemer is present and is not going to let them fail. The Redeemer is there, and when you are scared out of your mind, he's there. Ladies, men too, the Redeemer is there when you're scared in the middle of trusting your husband, in the middle of trusting the stuff going on, in the middle of things that are happening, he is there. He is there. 